Um, Nick Roush, he's Adam Luckett. This is 11 personnel presented by Monticello Bank. Our good friends at Monticello Bank been in business for over 125 years. They've been putting people first. They're going to put the numbers first for you whenever you're making your banking financial decisions. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. Visit them at either one of their many, many locations across the Commonwealth or visit them at NBCBank.com. Look it. Somebody may be making some financial decisions in the near future. Uh, it sounds like Liam Cohen. Uh, we feel like we've done this before, right? Uh, it's about that time of the year where we say, huh, Liam Cohen's leaving. Uh, it is Groundhog Day after all. So this one. De- deja vu here uh, in the KSR virtual studios. Oh, man. I was, was hoping to have a nice weekend down in Alabama with some family. Brought the kids down, hang out with their cousins. Uh, but instead, we got some breaking news this morning. I, I don't remember. I guess the, the Tampa Bay reports. Yeah, those happened Wednesday night. And last mm-hmm. night, we started kind of the way things were breaking. I just I got a bad feeling about it. And I saw so I got the post ready. And uh, this morning at uh, right about 8 a.m., Mike Garofalo, NFL media, along with uh, Ian Rappaport shared that the Bucks are working to finalize a deal with Liam Cohen to be their next offensive coordinator. Which, look, it, that is in if it was college football, they'd use the term zeroing in, where it's not a done deal yet, but it basically is. They just got to cross T's, dot I's. Right. Uh, in the hour since, Cohen Camp has put out there that there's no final deal, terms have not been discussed, there's no final offer on the table. Take that for what you will, but um, we're going to operate as though it is a done deal and that Kentucky will be looking for, I guess now, fifth offensive coordinator in five years? Yes. So. Fifth time they've done, or fourth fourth offseason in a row, I guess. 21, 22, 23, 24, they've done an offensive coordinator search. This one will be a little bit, will be a real search, unlike last year, yeah. Yeah, I think Nick just on the surface, like if you are Tim Thomas in Tupelo, Mississippi, who loves the Mississippi State Bulldogs, you see Liam Cohen's going to the NFL, and you're not really surprised. Like, oh, of course, the guy that was just with the Rams is going to be an NFL offensive coordinator uh, this year. That that I don't think on the surface it is super surprising. I think the surprising part of all this is just that we've got a double dip situation here, right? And he's making 1.7, he's going to make 1.8 next year. Are they are the Bucks going to pay him 2 million dollars? I, I don't know. I mean, that's going to be hard for us to find out because it's not like UK where we can find out the figures, the right, money figures, right. but you could easily make the argument that being the offensive coordinator for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers is a better job than being the offensive coordinator for the Kentucky Wildcats. But context matters in this situation, and he, Cohen, did him a little dirty twice uh, yep. with how he's leaving. And when you do an offensive coordinator search, you are out of the, the college carousel window, right? So if you're looking at college candidates – some guys probably not, are not going to want to leave, or some guys you might have been able to get have already taken jobs elsewhere. So you're behind the eight ball from that aspect. And then if you're Mark Stoops, I don't know how you go to the NFL again and hire an NFL You can't. Guy. You can't. I just don't know how you do it based on what has happened. And, Nick, I'm willing to bet in a reality world where Will Levis doesn't get hurt, Kentucky has a good year, Rich Gangarello is probably an offensive coordinator in the NFL after one year. Um Kentucky is somewhat a means to an end here when you do the NFL thing. So you have to expect when they get an opportunity, these guys are going to go. It's it's um, kind of like how UofL was there when they were in Conference USA and it was just a stepping stone job. And they, they got some real – there's a lot of scar tissue in that fan base from John L. leaving. At, you well, know, like, the problem is you don't mind – I don't mind being a stepping stone if you're getting the results, right? And that's if, the issue, right? If you're now. getting the return on investment, it's a good process. 
but the process stinks right now for Kentucky, and they're losing guys. One was by fire, the other by going to the Bucks. And so I think if you're if you're going or if not, excuse me, if you're Kentucky, I don't know if that's the path uh, you can go down again. And for Mark Stoops, man, um, I'm not sure much more what they could have done here. But at the end of the day, you've got offensive coordinator churn, major, major OC churn. Yeah. And you haven't been able to fix it. So a lot of that falls on you, even though in this situation, I don't think he really did anything wrong. Um, but the system that you've created has yeah. has this problem. So my, the buck does eventually stop here with him. My, I think, argument, you know, obviously hindsight's always twenty twenty. Um, because you are correct that this falls, this is a Stoops problem. Um, he's had, you, you crunched the numbers yesterday. There's only been twice where he's brought back the same offensive and defensive coordinators and they won three more games than the year prior. Um, the, 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 the turnover is really, really tough on this program. And I, I think the biggest criticism you would have in this situation is that he just fell hook, line, and sinker last year. For Cohen, and basically we treated him as the savior. That they didn't really run a search, right? Like it was just for bringing him yeah. back, and then they had this sort of. Stoops was like, "Yeah, he's he's not here. He's he's going to be here for multiple seasons, and we're going to groom his replacement to to fix this issue." And the thing was, is we I, I was under the impression that that was going to be bound in his contract that in Cohen's deal that the numbers were going to say you've got a huge buyout to pay if you leave after one year. That wasn't the case. He, uh, Jonathan DeShelter shared that, that those numbers, uh, it's only $250,000 per year for each remaining contract. I thought at the time it was going to be like a $1 million buyout if he left after one season, and then it would dramatically go down after the second. Uh, because Cohen was going to plant roots here, right? Well, those roots, it, it, that's just words. There's, there's, there was nothing in the contract that kept him here. And what changed over that year? I don't, th- you know, that that's up for debate, right? Yeah. Did it change when Stoops flirted with A and M? Maybe a little bit. Maybe some other things happened throughout the year that Cohen thought, man, this ship's sinking. I need to get out while I can. I need to get back to the NFL before um, I got too much college stink on me. I don't know, but there, there is truth to it that that. Some of this falls on stoops, but then the other part is, is like, well, this is also a Cohen issue, right? Like, did he do enough, as you said, like it to, to get to like, because fans, we understood it the first go around, right? Like it's the Super Bowl champs, you know, you get to work with Matt Stafford, you get to go back to McVay and And he had a good year here. Like he had a good year in this year, not the same. Yeah, I don't even think he did a bad job this year. I think it was disappointing. Um, I think some things got off track for them. But I don't think they had a terrible year. Um, They did some good things. They came up short in other moments. But I don't think it was that he had a bad year here. Uh, So I I think Liam Cohen's a good offensive coordinator. From that aspect, it really hurts. Because they haven't really hired many good offensive coordinators. Mm-hmm. under Mark Stoops, or things haven't worked out for some guys have been bad fits for one reason or another. And so that's the worry when you get into this into this search. But, uh, like, there's a, there was just a track record. It's two in a row he'd done one and done, right? Kentucky and the Rams. Yeah. Now, we don't really know what happened with the Rams and why uh, that did. Because Sean McVay made wholesale changes to his coaching staff. Uh, last year, brought in a ton of new offensive assistants. So you don't really know really what happened there. Um, but, again, use the word stepping stone. That's what it looks like Cohen used Kentucky for, which is his right. It's just tough, tough situation and because it makes you look like, in hindsight, was that, you know, Mark Stoops, was that the right move? And I'll, very be, I'll be interested to hear just what Stoops' tone is when they do make a change and they do – Talk to the media. I mean, it was Monday. We're you know the who's the ha- you know who's the happiest in all of this? Who's the big winner here? Eric Wolford. <laughs> he was public enemy number one of this fan base, and now no one's even going to remember that, or they might not remember Ooh. that until they give up a sack on week one. 
But right now, Al Cohen's getting a lot of the uh, the uh, heat here. But I did. You mentioned like what ha what went wrong. Like I don't know if it merely matters like when he made the decision or not. This was always going to end with him probably going back to the NFL. Correct. It's just you didn't think he would do it this time. And I think it's a lesson for people like. These coaches, when they get in front of the microphone, they're just talking, right? They're liars. Yeah. They, like, if you want to be harsh about it, you'll say, they'll I don't even want. They they're are like, lying. Whatever. They are lying, but you just have to look at it like they're just talking. And so don't really hold much um, weight to some of the statements they put out there. They're just talking. That's just part of the gig. Yeah. Like, do we think Cal really hasn't seen his injured players? You know, like they. <laughs> they're just they're just talking. Like, yeah. it, it's, yeah. it's a lot of times it's just empty words. And so mm -hmm. you have to. Remember that, and so I wouldn't like take that too personal or hold him to that. Um, but this is just how the business goes, and now uh, it's just you know you had a lot of now you've got a lot of turnover on offense because it's not just co you QB, OL, and receiver coach all out after this year. Your running back coach is in year two, right? It's Vince mm -hmm. and then a bunch of new guys on that side of the football. Uh, a lot of folks are bringing it up in the chat, so I'm going to go ahead and mention it as well. McCade's asking, what players do you think will leave? And the good news is, at least on the early returns, that Brock Vandergriff's dad is saying, uh, hey, he's not going anywhere. He's playing for Kentucky no matter what. Um, you know, those two are also just words. But we've mentioned it before, and we'll say it again. It is noteworthy that the portal doesn't open immediately for coordinator change. It only opens immediately for head coaching changes. So they can't just bolt right away. Um, they'll have to wait until – and it's so hard to find these dates on the internet, but I believe it's April yeah. 15th uh, is when the portal reopens. So Yes, that is correct. April 15th to the 30th. Okay. Um, so April 15th to the 30th. That uh, it basically – You won't be focused on anything else at that time of year. Uh, all you'll be worried about is portal. You won't have – your attention won't be anywhere else. Uh but that's after spring practice. So the new guy gets a trial with these guys to convince him that, hey, I can be pretty good. And here's something else to consider because we got to think back to where you were the last time you had a real coordinator. Like when you, when you go through these coordinator searches, this should be an attractive job for to find an offensive coordinator, right? Your guy's getting hired to go be a play caller for a playoff team. So that on face value should be attractive to this position. Another aspect of it, look at the guys that Cohen did draw in, right? I'm sure some guy out there is like, I can go coach this former five-star quarterback, all these receivers who could play in the NFL. Like they're, this job is attractive for that reason. And so now we can kind of get into who we think it could be. Um, but I, Really, if you set the timing aspect aside, because the timing's bad, right? Tomorrow is supposed to be in. I guess today. I don't. I don't really know how exactly the semantics are for Junior Day. It's one of the most loaded Junior Days recruiting weekends period I've seen. Some guys might decide they don't want to come check out campus because Cohen's not going to be there. But it is a loaded Junior Day. The timing, all that's bad. But outside of that, this should be an attractive job. It's an SEC gig, just full stop. Like, you're in the, one of the big two conferences, and you could come call plays for a program that has been to eight consecutive bowl games, um, that has gotten a coordinator, offensive coordinator twice, gotten him better opportunities, and at a place, Nick, that is looked at as not having super high expectations. So you can come in, win some games, score some points, and potentially get a better job. And, Nick, they have, to me, they have $2.3 million in cap space on the coaching staff right now. Now, how they use that is to be determined, but you don't have to pay Cohen $1.8, and the Bucks are going to have to pay you $500,000 uh, mm -hmm. because they that's the buyout. Two hundred fifty dollars per year left on his deal. Cohen has two years left on his deal. So that's $2.3 million um, that you had – that you that you have gotten to potentially spend on a coach, so you could go out and pay someone if you want. Now you don't don't spend over what the market is, what you can get for them, but that's what you have right mm -hmm. now. And there's going to be some candidates, but again, I think you have to look like college experience, and I think power conference experience are 
All right, if you don't have those, I, I think it's kind of a non-starter here. I think that yeah. that's going to be the pool that they will be swimming in in the search. And to me, that's where this – when you start looking at potential targets for this position, that's where you have to look. Uh, I would also add the emphasis on the power conference experience. That's where that Stoops is. It's a core principle of Stoops. Look at the transfer portal players he takes. Look at the. I mean, is Chris Collins the only coach he's hired without Power Five experience in the last six years? Yeah, and I do want to say something about the player retention here, Nick. It's two reasons I think they're going to be fine. One, a lot of these guys they've already inked to big NIL deals. So maybe there's a renegotiation that comes to the table in April, but I think they're going to be fine uh, for most of that. Number two, Vince Merrill brought a lot of these guys in. Yes, yes. That's and he's important. still on staff. So he's mm-hmm. going to be able to keep guys, ha- uh, I think, on the roster. And that's why Vince Merrill is paid over a million dollars is for situations like this, um, to go out and get players and then to keep players on the roster. That's why he makes over a million dollars. So I think they're going to be fine – uh, from that aspect. And if you're Brock Vandergriff, man, like, Cohen Lee's right. You're going to enter the portal. Where are you going to go if you enter the portal late? Like, there's not yeah. – the pool's not as big. Forget teams looking. Um, you're going to have less familiarity with what you're going into. Uh, I, I don't think Kentucky – I think they might do some structure changes on offense differently, but it's not going to be su- super different from what they were running. I, I don't think he's going to be a guy that they're going to have to – fight from leaving. And then uh, his dad, of course, went on record with uh, KSR Plus's Jacob Polachek today. So I think they're going to be fine from a player retention standpoint here. What I worry about is more kind of future recruiting, right? Yeah, you know, Stone Saunders is probably getting out of your class here pretty soon. And so what do you do in that 2025 class QB recruiting? Now you're kind of behind the eight ball, right? Cohen's out. You might not have Saunders. And then decisions are already being made. So you might be out on a 2025 quarterback. So that puts you – really in trouble. And that's where the, I think the continuity has kind of really messed them up is QB recruiting. Cohen, to his credit, I think fixed that in a short time here, but now he's gone. And so that that is the real concern when I look at kind of talent accumulation from that standpoint. So from doing your diving, I love – one thing that is fun about coordinator searches, um, let's get to throw a lot of names out there. I, I will say uh, – Dan Mullen, we, we've always had fun at the thought of that happening, uh, but I don't think that he – I don't think that's in the cards for him. Uh, for I look at it – yeah, I look at it this way. He's been out of football for two years. He probably would have taken a job if he wanted one. Like, I very much believe if Mullen wanted an offensive coordinator job in college football, he could have got a really, really good one at a Blue Blood program by now. Yeah, And that has not happened. I think he's enjoying being on ESPN and playing golf and then mm-hmm. and watching the sport burn itself to the ground with all the ridiculous kind of things yeah. going on right now. I think I, I just don't think that would happen. I thought it was an option last time around because he hadn't been doing it that long, but now that it's been that long and he hasn't made a move, I think he's just waiting it out and then he's probably going to emerge as a head coach somewhere down the road. The other former offense or former SEC coach, uh, that I do like as an option that would make sense would be Joe Moorhead. Yeah. We brought up previously. It would make sense from his standpoint too, because I don't, I'm not really sure why he took that dead end job, but he might not be a good head coach, but he's pretty good at calling plays pretty much everywhere he's been, including Oregon as recent as two years ago. He's got a good relationship with Mark Stoops and his ability to use the quarterback run game with Brock Vandegrift would make a lot of sense. So th- that makes a lot of sense on face value. Yeah, I think we look at a lot of these guys. I think QB run game has been utilized effectively, and Moorhead definitely checks that box. I wouldn't be surprised if that's a box Kentucky tries to check. Um, I know Brock Vandegrift said on Wednesday that he doesn't see himself as a dual threat, but they need to use his legs. And, Nick, we've seen Moorhead be a Power 5 offensive coordinator four years here recently. All of his units have a- are averaged over 31 points per game, and he's been on two teams that have won conference titles. He's been on both Penn State teams won double-digit games. We've seen five 1,000-yard rushers in six seasons in a power conference. Um, one of those was Nick Fitzgerald at Mississippi State. And so he runs the ball. Um, he's seen as kind of one of the best RPO play callers in college football. 
that he brings a lot of cachet, I think. I will be worried, like, how into it is he in with recruiting? But if you're just looking at best play caller and highest floor, I think he's up there, and he, him and Stoops have a good relationship, it seems like. The, the part of this, too, that fits the profile of the hires Stoops has made feels like there's a lot of short-term solutions when it comes to planning for the future, right? You, you did look at the lack of high retention rates on defense where you thought there might have been able to be some changes. feels like there's just a lot of Band-Aids, and Moorhead is an easy Band-Aid instead of going out and getting – some young up and comer that you're kind of taking a long term swing on. Yeah, I think Cohen, not the last hire, but Cohen, Cohen first and Scangarello first were big, high ceiling, low floor variant swings as a coordinator hire. I think you need a high floor hire here, especially if you look at the roster and you see just all of the upperclassmen on it. You kind of got to push your chips into this year and. I hope it all goes well, right? You just – if you're Stoops, your offense cannot be – you cannot have a repeat of what happened in 2022. And you cannot you cannot have a repeat of what happened in 2015 where you made two hires and it was just a bad fit and it ended up being a disaster. Like, you cannot have that. Um, and so, to me, that's why college experience and having play calling experience here is really important because, one, you need a guy to go out and recruit a high schooler, and, two – like you just can't. You gotta. You gotta get rolling. You've had two rough years in a row. You can't afford another bad year. And if the offense falls off a cliff a little bit, I mean, Kentucky could be staring at a four and eight or a three and nine, um, and then you get into like a DefCon level situation then. And so I think established experience and proven production are really impo- important here, even if maybe the ceiling isn't super high. Which I'm not saying it isn't for Moorhead or some of these guys, but um, you have to be, I think, more careful about this hire. Where I think Cohen first time and Scangarello were really big swings because you thought the ceiling could be really high. And you really hit well on one of them and you totally whiffed on the second one. My question for you, Luckett, um, why are do people in the chat keep mentioning Chip Lindsay? Because why would Chip Lindsay, I don't, I don't understand. I don't, I don't get that. He's at but, North Carolina right now. Uh, he runs a spread tempo offense, so yeah, I would not expect him to be a candidate here. Also, he sucked really bad when he was at Troy. And like, Troy, they scored points. They were fine. Different. He was at Auburn. It wasn't great under Malzahn. Yeah, I just – I don't think – no, I don't think yeah. that'll but develop. The other guy who – I why did you mention Kevin Johns? We thought he was going to be the Iowa offensive coordinator. And the, the sadistic way to look at it is like, well, if he's willing to coach at Iowa, then he can coach at Kentucky. But, but, but there is something, too. He was doing some really good stuff when he had the quarterback to do it. The problem with Duke was it's just Riley Leonard was hurt all year. and Yeah. You know, um, so I, he's, he's available. That, that, that one makes a lot of sense to me. And, and I don't know he, do, he is available, but – the the Georgia Tech coach you brought up, just in generally speaking, pulling previous Power Five coaches that are no longer in the Power Two, everybody's going to want to get in the Power Two, right? So I, yeah. I, I think that part is significant. Yeah, we'll start with Kevin Johns here, Nick. I would classify this as a high floor hire, right? Um, his first four offenses is a offensive coordinator at Memphis and then Duke for the last two years. They all averaged over 30 points per game. They came short of that number this year, but Leonard got hurt. Um, mm-hmm. He has a wide receiver coach background, also coach quarterbacks. He's, he produced two separate 3,000-yard passers at Memphis, spent a year with Memphis at Mike, with Mike Norvell, uh, spent time with Cliff Kingsbury at Texas Tech. He was at Kevin Wilson at Indiana um, – why is that relationship important? Kevin Wilson spent eight years working for Bob Snoops at Oklahoma. So just right there, there's that there's that yeah. instant connection. Uh, and he's a free agent, so you could go out and get him. Uh, he's available right now, and he could start working for you tomorrow. And so I think that's something you should – that they will con- – I think you could consider it. I think it makes some sense. But Mike Elko didn't bring him to A&M, so why didn't he? That would be something you would have to uh, ask yeah. yourself. 
and then Buster Faulkner, Nick. Like they have a mini. People have always compared or called Kentucky a mini Georgia. I think Kentucky really leaned into it this offseason with Vandegrift and Pop yeah. Dumas Johnson. And we heard both Vandegrift and Dumas Johnson talk about how much respect they have for the Kentucky program. Well, Buster Faulkner spent three years in Athens working as a quality control assistant under Todd Munkin, who's now calling place for the Ravens. Um, and in his first year at Tech, they had their best offense since Paul Johnson, since they left the option uh, offense. Um, top 30 in yards per play. Um, the offense, like Louisville shut, like totally clamped most ACC offenses except Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech had the game one until um, Haynes King fumbled the ball there. And the situation was kind of similar to me, I think. Uh, Haynes King and Brock Vandergriff are similar transfers. Yeah. King had a really good year, first year under Faulkner. Uh, Vandergriff's kind of in the same situation. Uh, his offense is probably a little bit more similar to Eddie Graham, which they operate a lot out of the pistol, uh, run zone, run a lot of stretch zone, but he involves the quarterback in the run game. Um, and they ran the ball really well last year, so I think Mark Stoops will like that. He's making $750,000 at Georgia Tech. You can easily – uh, they're right. probably going to be able to easily outbid them if they that came to that. So I think just when you look at obviously the Georgia connection, the, the potential Brock Vandergriff connection, if him and Vandergriff have a good relationship, um, you could get him out of Georgia Tech. He has proven, you know, three years of experience in the SEC, proven play caller in a power conference, and, and insert ACC joke here. Um, but I think there's there's stuff to like about him. Yeah, there there is a a, a lot to like about him. Um, and that, but he, he fits that up and comer mold, um, which I, I think would, would get fans excited. Um, that, that, that would be, you could easily sell people on this hire um, after seeing what Georgia Tech was able to do because they were that team like it throughout the whole year. You're just like, how do they keep doing this? What this team, they're not that good. And but they were scoring a lot of points. Um, yeah, I would be cautiously team, optimistic about that hire. Uh, because I thought he did some good things. And even – they played Georgia last week, and I thought they were able to move the ball on him. He utilizes the tight ends, even though they are kind of this pistol spreadish offense. So Kentucky's got tight ends. I yeah. think there would be a, I think there would be a lot to like there. I think he would check a lot of boxes for them. Now, I don't know if that will develop at all, but that seems like a potential good fit from where I'm sitting. And he's from Georgia. He's got Georgia ties. So he's probably going to be able to get down there a little bit and help you recruit – there, I, I don't know much about him as a recruiter. That would be something I have to dig into. That would be the big question mark, I think, with him. One connection that people are quickly jumping on, uh, especially in our city, is former Louisville quarterback Will Stein, who his dad was a walk-on at Kentucky. He was really good with the Roadrunners, helped Jeff Trailer in UTSA. Uh, I don't, did they win the conference or did they lose that conference title game that year? But They beat WKU last year. So they did win that game. Okay. Yeah. I think the tops covered, though, which is what I remember about that because I'm pretty sure I was on him. It was a very fun game at the Alamo Dome. He parlayed that into a gig at Oregon and has been kicking all kinds of ass. And yeah, they were awesome this year on offense. Yeah. Um, and look at – well, that sounds fun. And it is a lot of fun. I'm with you in that I – Oregon ain't letting him walk. <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you just have to look at it this way. He is a hot, hot name. If Oregon has another big year, he is going to get a head coaching job. And he is going to use this as leverage to get some pay out of uh, Mr. Phil Knight over there. And Phil Knight and Dan Lanning are not going to let him walk away. They're not going to go three offensive coordinators in three years to start Lanning's tenure. Uh, they are going to pay him. They are a serious national title contender this season. There are Kentucky ties, but he played at Louisville. So, how deep – just because his dad played here, and I think the Steins had season tickets for UK for a long time, he is a Louisville guy. Will Stein is. And so, how much does that weigh into that, too? You have to think. Not that, that that's everything, but – I do not expect that to happen just because – now, if he was still at UTSA, then we're talking, right? Then they have a chance yeah, at him. Yeah, but yeah. He's, but at, Oregon, he's at a top five college football program right now, and he's a play caller for a defensive head coach. Uh, he just coached the Heisman finalist, and they just landed uh, one of the top quarterbacks 
out of the transfer portal, and they have studs on offense. It's a little bit different for the other Louisville guy because Brian Brom was a finalist for the job when Cohen got hired back in 2021. He's looking for a play calling opportunity elsewhere. I think he would like the roster that Kentucky has. How much is it different now, though, that he's at Louisville versus at Purdue? Right? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 it, yeah. I think you don't. That, 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 that part makes, I think, a little bit of a difference. I'll give the out of the family response here for yes. the 11 personnel. Can Brian Brom, who played quarterback at Louisville's legendary player, can he really leave his brother in the middle of a five or six game losing streak to Kentucky? Can he <laughs> really do that? My answer is hell no. I do not see that happening. I think if he was at Purdue, Nick, I think that's yeah. very, very possible. And I think there's reasons to like Brom. There's or Brian Brom. There's not the play calling um, experience, but he's helped Jeff run that offense for like eight years now. And it's I think it's a similar mold to what Kentucky wants to do stylistically. I think it makes mm-hmm. a lot of sense, but I just cannot. I, it's hard for me, Adam Luckett, to yeah. sit here and envision. Right. Jeff Brom's brother, who Jeff Brom's doing a lot of good things, but the number one we got to turn this Kentucky series around. And right after that, he takes a bad loss right that weekend, and then two months later, his office coordinator leaves to go take the same job at Kentucky. I just cannot see that happening. It's hard yeah, to envision, thought- and it's and it's hard to envision. I think Brian leaving in that in that yeah. context. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, if y'all have just thought last Thanksgiving was awkward, man, this one would have been. Whew. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think if Scott Satterfield's still at Louisville, I think he's a prime candidate. I really do. Yeah. But I don't – he's not. The Brahms are at Louisville. So that's just hard for me to envision. Yeah, timing's not right there. Bush Hamden was another name that you mentioned um, on your short board that was a candidate last go around. The only part about this is that I know he's not the job, like he, he isn't the head coach, but he really is number two out there. And I think he's part Bo- like Boise State finished the year with a bang uh, with uh, the, the defense coordinator operating as the interim. And I could see him very well being a head coach next year um, if he can string together another good year. So I, I, I don't know if the timing is right in this uh, scenario as well. Yeah, I think for Bush Hamden, you just have to ask, do you want to be a G5 head coach or you want to try to get in the Power 5 and move your way up ladder there? He's still pretty young, 37 years old. Um, SEC experience, um, coached at Florida, coached at Missouri under Eli Drinkowitz. He was actually the play caller towards the end of the year when Drinkowitz gave it up for like three games, Missouri's last, I think, three games in 2022. He goes out to Boise State, and he had a really good year if you just look at the numbers. They were top 20, I think, in – Yards per play, points per drive, um, and success rate. So there's some stuff to like about him. He's He's been linked um, top 20 in points per drive and yards per play, top 35 in success rate. He's been linked to this job before. He interviewed with Mark Stoops. He was kind of a surprise candidate um, one of the years. that they All all these searches are running together. Uh, but I th- definitely think he's a guy that makes some sense. Just when you look at his background, has worked with both receivers and quarterbacks – in the past, has a strong resume, has some play calling experience. I think there's some things to like there. And you have to remember, I think Stoops and Drinkowitz have talked about that they have a good relationship. Apparently, they drink beers on each other's beach. Um, and uh, if he signed, if Drinkowitz, if Stoops caught him and Drinkowitz signed off on him, I could see this happening for Kentucky. But so that, that this is one I think definitely monitor. The one, the, the wildest of all wild cards. Like it, you just threw Dana Holgerson in there, which I don't, I don't know if I'm ready for a Holgo's hair flying in the wind on the Kentucky sideline. I don't, which from a content standpoint, that this is the one I would sign off on. (laughs) We could drink Red Bull. We could have Red Bull conversations. We could, you know, talk about Mike Leach. Here's just the thing with Holgerson, right? There's obviously the Mike Leach connection to both the Stoops family and the Kentucky football program and to Holgerson. Uh, Stoops has hired people twice off his staff in his tenure. Shannon Dawson and Dekeel Shorts. He's oh, had Neil good Brown, too, technically. Right? He's I don't know if he ever worked with Holgerson, but he might oh, have. Okay. Yeah. Um he's had 
good offenses. But the thing, with, if you go back to Dawson, the reason he wanted to go that route is because Holgerson's offenses were more committed to running the football. So I, I, it's a total wild card. I don't expect it to happen, but it links up in certain aspects, I think, where it makes some sense for you if that's something you wanted to do. I'm not saying they would want to do that, but the model's there. His style of play, I think, kind of matches what Stoops wants to do. And if you were looking to make a splash, it could, it might be able to work out. But I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it will. But I think it's worth noting that some of the connections he's had to Holgerson program. At least he does yeah. like how it operates, and he's a free agent, so. It could the be only worth difference the call. with him and so, like Morehead, for instance. The head, I, Holgerson's been a head coach for like 15 years now, straight. Yeah. It's one thing where Moorhead did three or – hell, I think it was just two at Mississippi State, and then he did a year or two at Oregon, and then he's done two years at Akron. You know, I, I, it's hard for me to envision some of these guys having somebody else be their boss, right? Like it, you, that, that, that's the part that I just can't mentally uh, get over. Yeah. Thing with Holgerson, he's been a head coach – since 2011, but he's only 52 years old. He'll be 53 in June. He's. I don't think he's. Yeah, yeah. He's I don't think done. he's. So when you talk about these guys, you have to think. Well, I don't think he's ready for retirement. And yeah. Holgerson does not strike me as a guy who's going to start doing a podcast and get in the media. Um, <laughs> that did, he does not strike me as that kind. Of, he, he, and he'd probably be good at it, but he does not Man. strike me as that. He's going to go to work somewhere. He, I think there was talk that he might go Nebraska and be a QC. And if he's looking to do that, he's obviously looking to stay in and potentially get a job somewhere. Man, I got so to say, something to consider. If Holgo ends up in Lexington, though, great for establishments at the Pavilion. That business will be booming down downtown Lexington. Uh, one person, uh, the sports talker, brought to me on the radio show today. And it reminded me of it because somebody was like, make Lane Kiffin say no, which really made me giggle. But Charlie Rice Jr. is on his staff, and there's not – he's – I know that they Lane has kind of purposely made it unclear who's calling the plays, but Jeff Lebby quickly got himself a job after spending some time with Lane. It's not the style, but Charlie Rice Jr. could be another up-and-coming – Yeah. Yeah, I have to. I think you have to thank what Ole Miss has on the roster this year. Before yeah. you get into anything, like I don't think he's <laughs> going to leave that team with Jackson Dart, an experienced quarterback. The time mm-hmm. for him to leave is probably after Dart leaves, before they break in a new quarterback. Mm-hmm. And at that point, Nick, he's going to be in position probably for a high level G five head coaching job, or he can go to more of a blue bloodish program like Levy in Oklahoma to go be a play caller for like a defensive head coach. So I don't think that would okay. that really would fit there in that yeah. in that in that regard. Love, love where your head's at. Love where your head's at. Um, this has been we we can do the whole in Redux once it's finally official. But there's just it's been kind of slapstick following the the Cohen back and forth over the few years, um, and Cohen has. Put up good points. I think I think a lot of the points of frustration for me is A, that twenty twenty one team had some good ball players on it. They deserve plenty of the credit for their success too. I got pretty frustrated, and I, I'm sure you did as well too, when hearing that the offensive woes this year were just Devin Leary problems, right? Like the and, a month ago, we were talking about Cohen's control or lack thereof of the offense, of discipline issues. Um, you know, some of that, that that's on you, you know. that That's on you, Liam Cohen. And just because things aren't going your way doesn't mean that it's also not your problem as well, that you need to address, that you need to deal with. And there was a lot of it's everybody else's, but I'm not, I'm not what's wrong with the offense here. When I think – it was fair to say if they aren't calling plays quick enough, we'll make them shorter. We'll do it differently. Do no huddle. Do so. I, you know, th- th- there was a lot of just finger pointing, but they scored 14 points against South Carolina and Shane Beamer this year. You know that 
the season could have been a success if you can find ways to score more points against a terrible South Carolina team, a five-win South Carolina team. So I, I wanted to see a second season of William Cohen, but if it's going to end this way, then you know what? So be it. Move on. We – we. And I, and, I, and I think part of it was just being prisoners of what were the previous five years and the inability to see a passing offense. But we put him on a pedestal for what he did in 2021. And you know what? Maybe we gave him too much credit then. But he's not the only one that can score some points, right? Like, Kentucky can be successful. And you know what? They can win 10 games by scoring 19 points per game. <laughs> They've done it. I know that it's a little bit different now, but – um, I, he's not the only one that can, that can operate a successful offense in Lexington, Kentucky. Yeah, I think there's no doubt about that, but we also have to, he's the only one really like in the Stoops era outside of a couple years for grand. Like it's been a big struggle for this program, uh, here. And there's a lot riding on this hire for Stoops. You know, they're on rock. I don't think they're on stable footing right now. They seem a little rocky yep. over there. The ground's moving underneath them a little bit. And so they have to get a guy in here and they have to – again, I don't think he needs to be – like they don't need to hire the second coming of you know, Lincoln Riley or Steve Sarkeesian or whatever, but they just need a guy that can come in and, again, high floor is what I'm kind of looking here. Just put a top put a top 50 offense on the field and you're going to be in position to win games um, with – the way Stoops wants to play. Um, and you've got weapons on this team that you should be able to have success success with. Um, but, you know, it's, it's so much offensive coordinator churn here, offensive line coach churn. Um, there's just been a lot of change for this offense. So, regardless, we're probably going to see some rocky moments again. And you have to get to a point where you have some level of continuity um, over there on offense. You cannot keep – doing this like it's not sustainable so you have to go out and get a guy and you got to be able to keep a coach here for at least a couple years I'm not saying you got to keep someone for seven but you can't have uh, one and done one and done one and done or fire at you know rifle fire I would say with Gangarello they had to move on but um, you can't really afford um, to miss here and I think that's that's the big thing regarding this hire I don't think Stoops has to hit a home run but they really need a double you know a good solid in the gap double here. Oh, it's been um, – And two more guys been, I want to touch on, Nick. Uh, yeah, Tommy Reese yeah. has obviously been reported. I did not put him on the list because he took a job with the Browns, and I didn't know how itching he would be to get back in the NFL – or, excuse me, back in college football because Bama still owes him money. And so he's probably he's getting some of that still by just taking a, brand, a lower position job. Uh, but there's obviously the connection with Eric Wolford, and I know Justin Rowland is reported he expects him to be a candidate. So that's one to watch. Uh, I think that would that would be a good, a really good hire, hire there. And then Brian Hartline is obviously a popular name, but I think it's important to remember in the search they the staff is full. They need a coordinator and quarterbacks coach. Mm-hmm. So if you were going to hire a coordinator that wasn't a quarterbacks coach, so in this case Hartline has a receivers background. If you were going to hire someone, you would have to – essentially, you would have – the extra assistant is on defense right now. So you would have to move the extra assistant over to offense probably, and you would have to demote someone off the defensive staff. So you would ha- – there's a lot of moving parts if you were going to do something like that. Or you would have to fire uh, or demote an offensive coach and just let Hartline plug in there. So there's a lot of moving parts there. So for that reason, I don't expect Hartline to be a serious candidate here. Uh, if it was a situation where they hadn't hired shorts yet and you still mm-hmm. needed to hire a QB coach and a receiver coach, then, yeah, I definitely think he would be in play. But for the current situation Kentucky's in right now, I, I don't see that happening or someone like Hartline with his background happening. I think it has to be a guy who can come in and coach quarterbacks as well. Uh, I'm, I'm with you there. Glad you brought up Reese as well because, you know, that, that, that possibility is out there. But um... – there's a lot of possibilities out there, and we're talking about them all on KS Board. Uh, you can sign up dollar for a month. It's a pretty great deal, and 
It's been an eventful morning on the board. Uh, shout out to the guy who we had our first uh, plane info sourcing on the board yesterday or two nights ago. It was like 1 a.m. after the basketball game. It's like, heard Cohen's on a flight to Tampa. He's going to be leaving at 6 a.m. the next morning. And wasn't wrong. Wasn't wrong. So uh, we'll be sharing a lot of information there. Join us. You won't regret it. We appreciate you joining us today. And did we just... Oh, there we go. Yeah. Look at all that. There's a lot there. So much there for you to offer. Well, I could... I, I would just like... It would be nice if we could... If I could get like an afternoon where something doesn't happen. Would that... Are we going to get that any, any this weekend? Well, you're going to have to wait a couple weeks for this search. Um, which, by the way, I... I February 9th, next Friday, I think we'll know who the next offensive coordinator is at Kentucky. Yes, I think this will probably would, move pretty fast. He's had three weeks to get his ducks lined up to put feelers out there. I mean, Stoops should have that short list in hand ready to rock and roll. So, um, yeah. I, yeah, I, and then just this weekend, man, it's I feel for him. It's tough. With This is a huge recruiting weekend. This is probably one of the best collection of talent that they've had all on campus in one weekend. And really one of the, I would assume one of the better ones in Stoops' tenure. And yeah. now you just got the Cohen situation. You know, he was supposed to be in Ironton with Vince and the kill shorts tonight um, to go see, there's some guys over there, they're recruiting, playing a basketball game and he's not going to be there and how they, you know, answer that. And there's schools competition, letting them know that, you know, their coach left again, you know? And so yeah. it's a tough yeah, situation. That- that, that it's not ideal when uh, you're some of your highest ranked recruits that you've been working to get on campus feel like you're in a good spot. They're finding this out from Tennessee coaches. It's just not. God, if we can we just beat Tennessee tomorrow, it would make me feel so much better. But I just I know I've I've had my heart ripped out by the Vols so many times. Like that, it's inevitable. I'm they're they're going to destroy me. So. Please win. Please win the one. <laughs> God win. Well, look, it's been a pleasure. It's been fun. Hopefully we get some uh, intriguing, exciting news. Keep it locked for more over the next week or two. For Adam Luckett, I'm Nick Rush. Go Cats and go Kroger.